This is Jackie Tantillo of Should Have Listened to My Mother. This episode of Should Have Listened to My Mother contains some graphic content that some may find disturbing. Hi, I'm Jackie Tantillo, and this is Should Have Listened to My Mother. Welcome back for another episode where my guests and I peel back the mom layers and try and understand what was really going on inside their heart and their brain. The role of motherhood can be challenging, trying to understand what moms were thinking, what they were feeling, always taking into play what preceded them, what was handed down to them from previous generations. My guest has quite the list of accomplishments. He's the author of a number one bestseller in the UK. He loves numbers. He's got a great memory coaches CEOs, and he was a convicted juvie. From Halifax, Yorkshire, England, hello, David Thomas. Welcome to Should Have Listened to My Mother. <laughs> you know, when you say it all like that, Jackie, I think, God, that is that is an amazing guy. And then I realized that it's me. <laughs> That's the problem, it, problem in life is you, would, you, you know, everybody achieves great things at some point, whether it's in relationships or whether it's success in a personal or professional endeavors. But we just don't really recognize it as much as we should because it comes maybe a bit easy. Well, I think it's hard for us to love ourselves. Sometimes we don't always love ourselves enough to say, hey, I, I did something. Yeah, I, w- I would admit, you know, I must admit, I'm not that modest. <laughs> if people go, it's like when people phone me up and they go, you know, I need a, I need a presentation skills coach. Are you any good? I'll go, I'm amazing. I'm the, I'm the best that's ever been. And they always laugh, you know, and I go, no, actually, I am really, really good. Because that's what my clients tell me. I'm not telling you, I'm not sat here in a vacuum telling me, telling you I'm good. Have you ever done comedy? No, I, I would love to have a go. I think that I'm 53. If I was going to do stand-up comedy, I would, like with everything, I believe in immersion. So I would throw myself in, and I would, but I would love to have a go, yes. Because the thing is, I, I, I wouldn't, I would be nervous, but I wouldn't be upset if I got heckled or people didn't laugh. I go, that's okay, because I've been through it as a speaker. You are, including that orange and black shirt that I saw you in one of your YouTubes, and you begin with, do you like my shirt? <laughs> Yeah, the shirts hurt your eyes, don't they? I think that's that's part of my that's part of my approach is to dazzle the audience so they can't hear what I'm saying. It's like you know, it's like watching static on TV. Back in the day, you know, when we when we had TV that wasn't 24 hours in the UK, it used to go to a dot and then static, and it was like the white noise, yeah, white 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 noise. White. That's where it comes from, like snow on the TV. That's what I'm trying to do to my audiences with my shirts. I do have some wild shirts. David Thomas is my guest, and the podcast is called Should Have Listened to My Mother. What is your mom's name, or what was your mom's name? Is she still with us? I should. How about we start there? Is your mom still with us? No, no. She she passed away 21 years ago, and almost at the same age as I am now, which is kind of weird, isn't it? So she died. She she was called Gillian. With a J, it was sorry with a G, G I double L I A N. So she was born Stocks, Gillian Stocks, married a guy. My father became Gillian Thomas, married another guy, became Gillian Greenwood. So those are very, very English, traditional, northern, working class surnames. She is quite a story. You also have a younger brother. I do. I have my younger brother is Adam, he's two years younger than me. And you took on the role of protecting your brother. Is that correct? I did. I think it was it was a two way street. The challenges that I had as a child, the it was two things. One, I was the eldest, so I kind of saw it as my issue. My my, I saw it as a as a cross to bear to protect my brother. But also, we are fundamentally different people. I've always been a people pleaser. He's always been really feisty. And so my, I kind of let things happen that I shouldn't have let happen because I was happy to, not happy, but I thought it was my duty to, to take that on and be a people pleaser. So what was it that you let happen when you were younger, being a people pleaser? 
What do you well, think? from the age, of, I mean, from the age of four, my earliest memory is my mother being drunk and sexually abusing me. That's my earliest memory at four. We say it's it's said by psychologists that we are not psychologically aware until the age of four. People have quite strong memories before the age of four, but we can't really consider them reliable. And so age four is a, is a critical age. And from the age of four, I can remember my mother sexually abusing me, but only when she was drunk. Because she was, she was addicted to drugs when she was a teenager. And then she became an alcoholic after that. And by the time I, I was three, four years old, she was, a, she was an alcoholic. And eventually that killed her. She died of an alcohol-induced heart attack. Can I ask your grandparents, was there alcoholism or addiction in the family line? You know what, Jackie? We will never know. The reason I called my book, Tell Me Why Mummy, I I wrote a book, it went number one in the Sunday Times, which is like getting a New York Times number one bestseller. Over a million people have read the book worldwide. And I called it, Tell Me Why Mummy. And the reason is because if I just had another day, I, and and if I knew it was going to be the last day that she was alive, and you, you just, you never know, do you? I would have sat her down and said, look, I've got some questions. Because oddly enough, or not oddly, probably, to those people who understand how these things work, her brother died at 49 from alcohol as well. But in, in, my, in my grandparents, I never knew my grandmother on that side, but I knew somebody who did know her. And even now I go up to their house and she used to work with my grandma and I go up to their house and because they're kind of friends of the family in many different ways. And I would, I would sit and talk to her and I said, what was my grandma like? And she was just life and soul, very happy, very bubbly, kind of a bit like me. And then I was like, what was my grandfather like? I remember him briefly and he was always very happy, very smiley, stern. So there may be, he may, he may, may been, he may have been quite a disciplinarian. And, and he used to call my brother young Satan. Which, <laughs> the feisty one. <laughs> yeah, the feisty one, right. So he'd go, come here, young Satan. I need a word with you. And he'd go, go away, granddad. Don't want to talk to you. And, you know, so he was a feisty one. And he called me, and he used to call me brother young Satan, which I just think is hilarious. But I, so I don't know, I don't know what their history was. I don't know the history of my grandparents. And I never will. I mean, I've spoken to my father, because obviously when he married my mother, he got to know the family. But he's always been very reticent about talking about it, because it was a, a very painful experience for him. He met my mum and fell in love and had these two boys. And it went pretty shit, pretty quick. And it just ended. Some of the stories he's told me were horrific. Before you were born, or after? Once you guys were, you two were born. All around, yeah. Before and after. So he knew. I mean, I'm, I'm, my dad knew. My dad was the kind of guy who thought, you know, he's an engineer, and he was like, "I'm going to sort this out. I'll be able to sort this out if we get things on an even keel." You know, if and, it, and of course the alcohol gripped my mother, and that sent the relationship to the wall. And unfortunately, my dad is very loath to discuss it. He just won't talk about it. So he would never have taken you two away from her. Oh, well, that that's a different kind of story. My father was, I, I'm pretty sure my, my father is autistic on some level. He, he's the kind of guy where he's, I've never seen him lose his temper. He's not really very empathic or very sympathetic. When it comes to issues, if when I've had major life events which have been hard in my life, it's kind of been there but not been there. If my dad phoned me up tonight and I said, you know what, I've got something, re- I've got depression and I'm on tablets for depression, which I'm not. But if I said that to him, I would consider that a major life event. But he still wouldn't phone me for another three months because he lives in the US. And so it would be, you know, for me, if my son said he had, was on, you know, I was taking tablets for depression. I'd be in the car in a minute and just be there and be stuck to him to help him through this. And I would, there's nothing I would not do. But my dad's not like that, so there's never any danger of him of him taking 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 us away. Did your brother know what was going on? No, never did. 
and you never told him. Still, now. no, I, I didn't tell him or my brother until I wrote the book, which is a very interesting um, kind of challenge, I would say. So I wrote the book when I was just short of 40. So my brother was just short of 38. And my brother and my father knew nothing about what had happened to me. And I sent them. So I got the book deal first. I thought, I'm not going to tell them I'm writing this book, which is going to cause a major storm in the family if I don't get a book deal. So I got in touch with the, the publishers and the biggest publisher in the world in the genre that I was writing in said, yeah, we're going to do this. And they paid me $150,000 to write this book. So I knew it was going to be a monster. I thought this is not going to glide under the surface. It's not going to pass under the radar. So I got in touch with them both and I said, you need to read this. And both of them disowned me on the spot. Because they would be embarrassed or they would they felt it wasn't true. My brother said, I don't really recognize the house of horrors that you described, which I thought was interesting. But he didn't think it he didn't say he didn't think it happened to me. My dad was just he was just he, he didn't even lose his temper, but he was like, I don't want this out in the public eye. He didn't ask about the book. I didn't bring it. I thought he he's the one that said he didn't want to see me ever again. Therefore, if he's got a question to ask or an issue to bring up or something to resolve, it's all on his side. And because of the kind of relationship we had, I had nothing to say. I wanted the book to be written. I wanted to help other people, which is what happened. I got emails and phone calls all over the world. People ringing up and going, same thing happened to me, never resolved it. How can I deal with it? Did you have anyone there for you, David? We had my grandma who married my granddad. He disappeared fairly quick. She brought my dad upon his own as an only child. God only knows what that house looked like. <laughs> Between my dad being kind of what I perceive to be autistic and my grandma, who, let's, let's face it, had some unusual views on life. Then he met my mother. My mother was an alcoholic. She had a brother who was an alcoholic. My, my, my uncle on my mother's side, my, brother's, my mother's brother, was some kind of genius. He should really have gone to Oxford or Cambridge or, or Harvard or Yale. It was at that level of intelligence. And it, he, you know, but, but by the time he left university, where he came out top of his class in mining engineering, he was drinking a bottle of whiskey a day at 22. It was like your mom, wouldn't she? Yeah, yeah. My mother was drinking. Brandy. Yeah, she could drink. She could drink hard. I mean, she, she didn't mix. She didn't, she didn't go for the soft stuff. She didn't work her way up. She just, because whatever it was, she didn't drink for the alcohol. She drank to get drunk. Those are the two pathways down and whatever whatever happened in her house. I've got my father, who's a, who's still alive and living in Richmond, Virginia, who's interesting, shall we say, and is, you know, and is, uh, you know, and uh, had his mother. And then there's me. <laughs> Come to <laughs> <laughs> you say, no, I've heard you say it's not the cards that you are dealt in life, but the way that you play them. How did you well, get your act together? Oh, I, well, to be fair, I didn't really. But, you know, I left, I left school, I, you know, by the time I got to 16, I mean, you, you know, if there's any of this you want to know any more details, I'm, I'm happy to say, but come 16, by the time I'm 16, I'm just going off the rails. So I get involved in petty crime, for not because it was cool, not because of the, any other kids. So I wasn't part of a gang. Nobody knew what I was doing at all. I was just breaking into shops and businesses in the middle of the night. Why? <laughs> Why? Well, I, don't, I don't know. You were abused at home. Of course you're going to lash out. Well, I, I read something. I saw something by Jordan Peterson this week. Well, I'm quite a fan of watching, who's become a, good, a big a big figure now. You know, he talked about the fact that if if you live in misery long enough, it will come out demonstrating itself in some form of malevolence at some point. It just will. And whilst I get that and I can turn around and blame my circumstances, in reality, there must have been kids in that school because I went to a bloody awful school there must have been kids in that school going through worse than me that didn't go out and commit the crime so i can understand it was a trigger 
But you know what? The, the most, the single thing that has stood by me all of my life and that has eventually got me out of the crap and got me to the point where I'm having a good life, an amazing life, traveling the world, doing this, is, is understanding the concept of absolute responsibility. So if I did the crime, I do the time. I don't complain. I don't bitch. I don't moan. I don't be what I call a BM, don't be bitchy, moaning, whinger. Right. So I don't do any of that. And it's like, I did it, put my hand up, I got caught. I didn't try and say it was any other issues. And then as you're going through life, if you accept that, if you're in a relationship and you're not treating somebody else well, that's on you. And if you go to work and you don't do the job to the best of your ability and you get sacked because, you know, your job gets terminated, that's on you. If you have kids and you don't give them the time and energy that you should, that's on you. You can't blame other people. You can't blame things forever. J.K. Rowling is the author of the Harry Potter books. And she had a phrase which was, there is a sell-by date for blaming your parents. And I thought, that's so true. Now, I get that. But at the same time, I understand that sometimes it goes deep with people. They end up with mental health issues. I'm a lot more sensitive to, them, to that than I used to be. I wasn't unsensitive to other people's mental health issues but I never really suffered them. I just cracked up because once I left home, everything changed. I wasn't in the toxic environment and now I could make choices. I could make choices about what I ate, about what job I did, about where I went, who I hung around with. That doesn't mean to say there weren't dark times because there were, but ultimately I did understand I had choice then. What was it that your mom was so sad about or why was she in that deep dark place do you have any idea that's the million dollar question isn't it i, I don't know and that's why i called the book tell me why mommy because i what i'd want to sit down and go tell me why why did you do what you did to me why did you turn to drugs and alcohol why did your brother turn to drugs and alcohol what was it about your home life growing up that turned you you know, towards the darker side of life. Why did you never get help for the alcoholism? Why did you marry a guy who's 35 years older than you, who you also knew was was um, physically abusing me? Why, 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 why? And that's what I would do. But honestly, Jackie, I, I don't know. Did you ever confide in anybody? I confided in a guy at school when I was 16 because I attempted suicide twice at 16. And so I did talk to one guy and I mentioned it to him. And I think things got a bit weird. When I was kind of 15, 16, so I'm in, in the last year of high school, it ended up getting to the point where the wrong kind of guys would want to hang around with me, the crazy guys, you know what I mean? Because I was I was kind of violent as well. Not really towards the other kids, but I'd been violent outside school. And so they saw me as kind of a hard guy. And so the kind of hard, crazy guys in school wanted to hang around with me. And I didn't really want to hang around with those. And the nice kids just were well, like, I'm keeping away. You're a bit crazy. There's something about you that's just not quite right. And so therefore, if, even talking to this one guy, it was kind of in passing. Things, you know, things are going off at home. And... You know, and it's at 15, 16, even if you're sharing it with somebody else, they don't they don't go away and act on it, not usually anywhere. Completely on my own. Utter, utterly isolated on my own with it. And then once I left home, it was just that that it felt like a chapter in the book had shut. And then I got on with sorting out my life. So when you say you attempted suicide twice, and obviously it didn't work. Do you, is that a, a gift that you were given to, to work your way through this journey of yours? No, I just did it badly, Jackie. <laughs> it's a, I mean, honestly, I, my, my sense of humor these days is dark. It's as dark as you can imagine. But seriously, I, I was stood there at the side of the road. I'd, I'd done some, I'd committed a burglary. I'd been, you know, breaking and entering. I'd taken some stuff into school to sell to the kids. The headmaster found out, called me into his office, said, stand there. 
were calling the police. I said, not a chance. So I bolted and went down to the main road near the school and just thought life, I just thought the world was going to crash around me. I thought the police were going to come, somebody would come from school, but nothing happened. And I just got really agitated. And 20 minutes later, I turned to a woman who was a dinner lady. So she was one of the people who worked in the school at lunchtime, serving as lunches. That's what a dinner lady is in the UK. And I just said to her, I've had enough. And I just turned, walked straight out in front of a car. And if it had been a 10 ton truck, I'd have just been mowed down in the street and wouldn't have been here now. And then, then later on, when I, um, I, I got myself into a mess because I was 16, Hormones were going crazy. I'm going through adolescence. I mean, never mind guys not wanting to talk. The girls wouldn't come anywhere near me. I couldn't get a relationship going. A girl came to the school who kind of didn't know what was going on. We saw each other for maybe two weeks, and then she dumped me, and I was just in bits. So my parents went out one night, my mother and my stepfather, and I sat there and just swallowed a load of tablets and just kind of assumed they would kill me. But apparently I took the wrong ones. <laughs> So, you know, I couldn't even make that work properly either. So I woke up in them. I thought, so I, I took all these tablets, about 40 of them, whatever they were, you know, paracetamol or anodine or something, whatever could get my hands on, just sat there and had them all. And then, you know, I could feel myself going woozy. And I thought, this is it. I'm done. Went to bed. I woke up in the morning feeling really, really bad. Just terrible stomachache. Didn't tell my mother. And she's like, what's wrong? And I went, oh, I'm feeling sick. And she went, come on, we're going out. Because she was very kind of, very matter of fact. I'd never got away with being off sick from school. You know, go, oh, I feel a bit sick. Oh, okay, really? Yeah, okay, well, let's just see how long that lasts. You didn't so know she was like, pills missing, of all things? Right, eh? <laughs> well, the thing is, my mother, my mother drank so much that I my mean, stepfather was now in his mid-70s. He was like 75, 76. So tablets that, these were tablets he bought over the counter. So, these, you know, these were, in, in the UK, we have something called paracetamol or, you know, just headache tablets. And, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. And, and you know, and now, of course, of course, I sit here and go, amazing. You know, I'm glad I didn't do that, of course. Do you have any children? Uh, I'm a father of three. Well, when I say a father, I I met a woman who had two kids and then I took those kids on as my own. And even though I'm not still with that woman, those two those two kids consider me their father. And then I had a, another relationship with a woman. We had a child. So I have three children, one boy and two girls. And do you drink at all? I, I drank very heavily in my 20s. When I went to live on my own, and when I went to 18, I got myself like a little studio apartment in town. It was, you know, not great, but I wasn't on much money. I was on very little money at the time. I was on like, you know, $3 an hour when I was 18, but I just didn't want to live at home. So I found somewhere that was dirt cheap and just kind of lived there. And and I just found that the, the shyness that I'd had as a kid, because I'd just been a massive introvert, huge wallflower just wanted to disappear into the background and it was yeah it was difficult so once i found that you know i found drinking was a real good way for me to get what we call in english in england dutch courage so it got my you know it made me it just gave me a lot more confidence and then i joined and i've been working in a factory you know packing christmas gifts into boxes i hated that and then all of a sudden at 20 things changed i became a firefighter now i was on a decent wage and being a working class guy a blue collar guy from the north of england everybody loves a firefighter and so i found that you know i was going to the gym i was a bodybuilder i, I could run through a brick wall i looked good i was in great shape i dressed well i had a bit of money and then a bit of alcohol gave me confidence and then i just found that you know, I kind of lost seven or eight years drinking really heavily, but I didn't used to drink at home. But then over the years, I decided to stop. And when I met the woman, the mother of my eldest two kids, we used to go out drinking and she said, you're a bit of a nasty drunk. She said, if you don't stop drinking, I'm going to leave you. So I did. I stopped drinking for 10 years just because I'm all or nothing. That's my personality, which I'm kind of guessing is like my mother, really. So nowadays, I might have a bit to drink here and there, but not a lot. Have you spoken to your children about your book and your past or what happened? 
So I took the kids on one side when I wrote the book and I said, look, you just need to know I'm writing this book. It's going to come out. And, you know, I think the, the, the youngest, the boy at the time was like 16. Mm -hmm. And so I said, look, you need to know this is coming out. And he's like, fine. And then my daughter, me and his daughter was only like two or three. So we've never had those conversations. And, you know, maybe we will at some point. She's 17 now. But, the, you know, the moment's been and gone. The book, the book as, as most books do, it lasted a year, maybe 18 months. And then it falls off the bestseller list. And getting doing an interview for the book, it, it will never happen again. It's been and gone. It's a part of you. And the more people that know and understand will have a more vocal voice for helping somebody else or, and being more compassionate. That's why I did it. I felt very uncomfortable talking about the background. If my mother had still been alive, I wouldn't have written a book. But the good it did was huge. I could see that other books had been written in a similar style, and I used to read them, and they were true. The, the books were true, true stories. And I could see what it did for me. So I thought, I'm going to do it for somebody else. Bravo. Good for you. I thank you for that. So in closing, my wonderful guest, thank you for being so honest and open with this conversation, David Thomas. He's a global speaker and CEO presentation skills coach who loves helping others develop their presentation skills. You're very good at it. And you're author of the book, Improving Your Memory, as well as Tell Me Why, Mommy. Thank you for joining me on Should Have Listened to My Mother. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Why am I laughing? After I don't know, because, because just... Because it, because because the thing is that you've got to try and look at things through a different prism. You know, and I appreciate many can't, but whatever, you know, in, in closing, what I will say is this, that if you're going through a place of pain because of something that's happened in the past or maybe in something that's happening now, you've only got two choices. You've got three choices. One, just carry on, let it run in, but it will take you down like it did my mother. Two, you remove it. So at one point, I did not speak to my mother for five years. Me and my brother went up. She was causing mayhem, calling work and everything else. And we both went up and said, we're never going to see you again. And my brother never did. We only reconnected one year before she died. And then I was able to build a, a relationship of a kind with her. And then I made sure she got the burial that she, she wanted. Or the third one is you manage it. And if you can't manage it on your own, then you manage it with somebody else. These days, there, are, there is a Facebook group for everything. Go out there, look for help, get psychiatric counselling, you know, whatever it is, there's people out there that would love to help and make your life better. Thank you, David Thomas, for joining us on Should Have Listened to My Mother. We'll be back next week with another episode.